Hallelujah. Okay, just for these last few minutes, because there's so much uh, still in a way. And I ha may I just say that Roger and I, and many others, I mean, with Richard, um, and then reading and sometimes speaking with Tony Pierce and others, there's a constant <coughs> evaluation, examination, in prayerfully going on about all these things. And if it wasn't for the saints who are actually watching the, the way things are going in the world, we wouldn't even have, if you like, the warnings and, and the, the, the Spirit speaking to us to watch out for certain things. But there's so much going on, it is impossible uh, to put it in <coughs> even a whole day. And you wouldn't want to do it anyway, because it, not, it wouldn't be boring, but it would just be too much. So what I'm going to try and do is just to instill in a few moments some more uh, thoughts about, about this jigsaw puzzle. And this time I want to just touch a bit more on Israel, upon what I would call the geopolitical moves, the one world government, and religious pluralism. <coughs> so, one of the signs that we're in the last days is chaos. Chaos in the political, financial, and the social structures of the world. And it's clear to me that we are on the verge of entering into the most tumultuous period in the history of man. The prospects of a global depression, the likes of which have never been seen before. A truly global war, we've already heard about that, on a scale never before imagined. <coughs> the societal collapse for which nations of the world are building totalitarian police states to control are increasing by the day. Major global trend forecasters are sounding the alarms on the economic depression, war, a return to fascism, and a total reorganisation of society. <coughs> It may sound very unreal to you, but it is where we are. And for Christians, it's also what we understand will happen in the last days. Let's just quickly have uh, some, some headings, and then if, if you have the headings, I'll just run through bits, because we haven't got a lot of time, but the notes will cover it <coughs> in more detail. Four main headings, geopolitical, security, geo-financial and geo-religious. Geo-religious really covers a lot of the pluralism. <clears throat> the big players um, in the political sense worldwide are the Illuminati, the Bilderberg Group, the Trilateral Commission, the US Council of Foreign Relations, Freemasonry, United Nations, NATO, USA, Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, Iran, the Organization of Islamic Countries, and the Muslim fundamentalist groups. In a one world government, which is part of this geopolitical picture, is very important for us to understand. Because we are in a spiritual battle. And the kingdom, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And just as in the church, when things are in the doldrums, the first thing that often happens, not just with the minister, usually not, but sometimes, but certainly with the elders and certainly with people, is, is that always we want to reorganise something in the hope that that will bring about the, the sort of change or the sort of outcome that we would like. It, certainly politically speaking, that's what we've been going through throughout the last government, and now with this new one. Always to reorganise, produce new policies, new guidelines, new me means of measuring or checking outcomes or whatever it is, controlling the money in the hope that that will put things right. It's sort of part of where we are as human beings. Yeah. But that's what's going on on a worldwide basis. <clears throat> We're seeing the reorganisation of the global political economy and the, transfer the transformation of capitalism into a form of totalitarian capitalist world government. Now it is true, we have to accept, capitalism has never stayed the same throughout history. It's always morphed into something, another <coughs> variation on the theme. And that's quite normal because things have changed and we've become more global. But this is different. Experts say the next phase of capitalism is one in which the world moves to a state-controlled economic system 
bit like China's totalitarian capitalism. But global political economy itself is being reorganized into a world government body consisting of one center of global power where the socio-political economic power of the world is centralized in one institution. It's not a conspiracy theory, although it is branded as a conspiracy theory, <clears throat> and anybody that mentions it will be branded as being somebody who's into conspiracy theories. This subject is not confined to the realm of internet conspiracy theorists, but in fact the concept of world government originates and evolves throughout the history of capitalism and global political economy. And through this, we see the, the power of Freemasonry over the years. All these things are linked together, by the way. They're not separate organisations. One has led into another, and they work together. Freemasonry, with its all-seeing eye on the American dollar, the number of American presidents, in fact, I believe it's every single one of them has been a Freemason. The link to Rosicrucianism and the mystical religions, and mainly coming out of Germany. And then the International Bank of Settlement, which was formed before the Second World War, was run by the Bank of England, and which totally and utterly reneged on our uh, allies, Czechoslovakia, and gave all of Czechoslovakia's gold, which they held, to Hitler, to placate Hitler. <coughs> we still live with that today. There's a Rhodes Scholarship. <coughs> Cecil Rhodes, many of you learnt about at school in your history lessons. But it's much more than that. He was the originator of the one world government idea, mainly that, that Great Britain should be the one world government and that America should become part, a colony simply, governed by, the, by Great Britain. And Great Britain would rule the waves and everything would be run, the whole world, in his idea. The Rhodes Scholarship was given to Oxford University to select future world leaders and to bring them into, uh, into the university in order to let them have a scholarship in world governance and particularly the whole theories of Cecil Rhodes and the banking fraternity and others. And one recent example of someone who had a scholarship to go there was Bill Clinton. Interesting, in America, at the time of Andrew Jackson, it would be, uh, in the sort of early part of the 19th century. I love this quote on the issue of creating a central bank of the US. He stood firm and opposed it. He said, the bank threatened the emerging order, hoarding too much economic power in too few hands, and he referred to it as the monster. So Congress immediately allowed a bill <laughs> for the creation of a second bank of the United States, which he vetoed straight away. <clears throat> President Lincoln said, the money powers prey on the nation in times of peace and conspire against it in times of adversity. Banking powers are more despotic than monarchy, more insolent than auto, 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 sorry, auto, auto, I can't get the word out, autocracy, more selfish than bureaucracy, and they denounce as public enemies all who question their methods or throw light on their crimes. And then Lincoln said, I have two great enemies, the southern army in front of me, the bankers at the rear. And of the two, the one at my rear is my greatest foe. As a most undesirable consequence of the war, corporations have been enthroned, and an era of corruption in high places will follow. The money power will endeavour to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of people until the wealth is aggregated in the hands of a few, and the republic is destroyed. This whole thing about the emergence of a one-world order and the whole movement towards it and the planning for it is not something that's recent. From the early 20th century, in America, J.P. Morgan Bank extended total control over railroad and banking interests. And they were regarded as the imperial leaders of the new oligarchy in America. So the power wasn't in the White House. It never has been. It's in the banking. John D. Rockefeller took control of the oil market and expanded into banking. And uh, the Rockefeller Foundation is one of the main arms of Illuminati, Bilderberg and the One World. And uh, we read that the combined assets of the new National City Bank of New York, which was part of the Rockefeller interest, uh, three men controlled this whole empire. 
They had 341 directorships in 112 corporations, and the total resources of their corporations in 1912 was 22.245 trillion dollars. More than the assessed value of all the property in the 22 states and the territories west of the Mississippi, Mississippi River. <coughs> These banking interests, particularly those of Morgan, were very much aligned with European banking interests, which leads us on to Cecil Rhodes. We know the history, but Cecil Rhodes, together with Alfred Milner and two other men, formed a, a secret group to pursue British rule throughout the world and perfecting this one world government. And who funded Cecil Rhodes' work in South Africa? Who funded his purchase of the De Beers diamond mining interests? People think it was mainly Cecil Rhodes, but it was Rothschilds mm -hmm. and the banking organisations mm -hmm. who are committed to control of the world's wealth and power. Then you think about the European Union and the federal states in Europe. I've just had to just sort of lead you into that, to, that one world government is such, it's everything is about this, and the European Union is part of it. Mm -hmm. I believe the European Union is the experiment that Bilderberg set up to see how this could work. And Roger mentioned about the 10, uh, the, the, the ten um, crowns uh, that the Antichrist would have. Well, part of the banking proposal worldwide, which was set up a few years ago, and a Canadian banker, financier, a really clever guy, was asked to produce a scheme whereby all the world's currencies could come into one new world order currency. And his proposal was to group the world into ten regions, and each region would have its own currency. And I think that's the ten crowns in a way, and then that would come together as the one. Control of the whole world's money uh, and wealth uh, and industry, commerce and, and power. But the European Union, this experiment, Baron von Rompuy has spoken of the need to strengthen economic governance and Dominic Strauss-Kahn said on the 27th of November last year, countries must be willing to cede more authority to the centre. I think what that means, and Daniel Hannan would explain it to us quite succinctly, he's our MP, by the way, in, uh, in, 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 in the European Parliament, he would just say, what they mean is, you will have no sovereignty and you'll do as you're told. Because that's pretty well where we are. Within the federal states, and it is the federal states of Europe, don't think of it as the EU. We never signed up to the EU. We never signed up to the federal states of Europe. But we are a federal state. And we are, in the south of England, mm. FX. We are part of France. Yes. In the grand plan of things. Yes. So, European Bank, which in, in turn was helped, that was created and funded way back by American interests. And uh, now is very much a German bank. Germany controls the money and the wealth, but works very much in conjunction with some of the private interests which control the wealth. And their leaders and directors are part of Bilderberg. Within the Federal States of Europe, you have the European Parliament, which is bringing more and more power to itself. The European Court, which has taken authority over decisions in the member states, and our own uh, courts keep objecting, but they don't get much success. And in, in addition, the Eurozone and the Euro, which we know is on its way out. So the whole thing about the federal states of Europe, for me, is another sign of the geopolitical movement, the movement to one world, of which the European Union is a sort of experiment, and certainly is one of the crowns. Within that, you've got to think about security. I think security is another major area, because this is about personal liberty and freedom, we're simply watched, controlled, uh, a bit like 1984, you know, but worse. So we are covered now with cameras, CCTV, facial recognition technology, microchip implants, and so it just goes on. We're moving to the cashless society because that's the decision of the ones that want to hold the power. And they'll hold the power because our credit cards will be the key, and the credit cards will have every bit of information, and eventually there will be the chip which is part of the EU proposals for the European Bank and everything else. And every member of the federal state, every individual will have a number. And that number will be held on the, the big central computer, 
which funnily enough is called the beast and its number is 666 and they thought the number will be 666 and uh, everything will be controlled, all our money will be controlled, what we receive in pay or allowance to live on and, and, what, and everything will be controlled in terms of what we buy. Identity cards will be a thing of the past because that will all be part of who we are. Our computers are, are, can be read and bugged at any time by all manner of people. Our conversations on television, uh, tele, telephones and mobile phones are recorded. Uh, and of course, we are giving more and more information, private information about ourselves away on census, on the census, and other, other things that we have to fill in everywhere we go. Security is supposed to be a big issue because all this is going to protect us from the extremists. But actually, it's the extremists, politically, financially, who are actually imposing all this so that they can control us. And I know, I feel I am totally, not totally, but pretty well controlled now. So I'm one of these that writes letters and refuses to pay and carries on as long as I can because I object to all this. But the security issue is part of what's going on. The geofinancial thing, which I've alluded to, involves... I mean, the Bible has so much to say about money and moneylenders. I, I, there was, I think there was over a hundred references to, to money and, and moneylending. But dishonest scales, borrowing and corruption are all specifically referred to as not being of God and against God. And the way that you can tell that this is not of God. So, you know, the passages right from Leviticus 36 up to Luke 3.14. And we see all that in the G20 countries and the things which are going on, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the Federal Reserve Bank, which is owned by all the banking interests and the power brokers in America. And although it's supposed to be the American bank, it is the power broker for the One World Movement. In the early 20th century, European and American banking interests achieved what they had desired for over a century within America, the creation of a privately owned bank. And it was created through the collaboration of American and European bankers, primarily the Morgans, the Rockefellers, the Kuhn Loebs, the Warburgs, and after the 1907 bank banking panic in the US, instigated by J.P. Morgan, instigated by the bankers, Pressure was placed on the American political establishment to create a stable banking system. In 1910, a secret meeting was held. I love this, on Jekyll Island. <laughs> Says it all. Uh, where they planned for the creation of a National Reserve Association with 15 major regions controlled by a board of commercial bankers, but empowered by the federal government to act like a central bank. And Woodrow Wilson, who was president, followed the plan almost exactly as outlined by the Wall Street financiers, and added to it the creation of a Federal Reserve Board in Washington, which the President would appoint the Federal Reserve or Fed to raise its own revenue, draft its own operating budget, and submit neither to Congress uh, or to any other authority, while the seven governors shared power with the presidents of the 12 reserve banks, each serving private banks in its region. So the government doesn't have an awful lot of say over how they raise the money who they lend it to and how it's used. So that brings us into the current situation which we're in at the moment and which is about to change again. And even though our present uh, Chancellor is coming up with some proposals, it doesn't uh, avoid the issue that banks and financial services are part of the end time signs of things which are going on. The amount of corruption, the, 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 the control that they have <coughs> over this uh, every individual's wealth, their ability to create money at the drop of a hat. They don't need government permission to create new charges. They don't need anybody's permission to raise more capital through special charges. They don't need anybody's permission to not lend to, to industries, the ones they like, to companies they don't like. They have such a lot of power. That must say there's something wrong. The personal data which is held by unelected groups and the fact that the power brokers are behind the scenes. And like Roger, I can think of one in particular in politics who fits the bill for being the prophet to the Antichrist. The demand for a president of the federal states of Europe, for me, is just another sign. There's somebody's going to be crowned. There's going to be the, one of the crowns straight away. 
Carol Quigley, uh, a man writing uh, from Georgetown University, he's a history professor, he said, uh, the merchant bankers of London already had, in 1810 to 1850, the Stock Exchange, the Bank of England, and the London Money Market. And in time, they brought into their financial network the provincial banking centres, organised as commercial banks and saving banks, as well as insurance companies, to form all of these into one single financial system on an international scale, which manipulated the quantity and flow of money so they were able to influence, if not control, governments on the one side and industries on the other. And apart from that, another sign is the way global trade is going. The global trade that seems to matter most of all are, are made up of delegations selling arms and technology and military things to rogue countries, terrorists, and to the Muslim countries. There's a manipulation of exchange rates and currency values, which are done deliberately to put countries almost on the edge of bankruptcy, then they'll accept the package that's offered as a rescue. Then they come under the control, just like Greece, having to do, Ireland is having to do. One-sided investment in Western countries not reciprocated by Arab, Chinese, North Korean and some African countries. Ownership of former so sovereign and strategic infrastructure like the ports, water, gas, electric, airports, nuclear generation and power stations in this country were left with less than 10% of what was our heritage <coughs> owned by foreign countries, conglomerates and governments <coughs> at whose mercy we are. Great Britain? Hmm. So in all these things, we begin to see the geopolitical and geofinancial hand of the end times. Geo-religious, just in this last couple of minutes, the rise of radical Islam, the determination for a worldwide caliphate, the funding of extremist madrasas by Saudi Arabia, whilst being, at the same time, a friend of the West. The allowing to build a mosque over important Christian and Jewish sites, including Ground Zero, Huge population planting in the West by Muslims, particularly in the USA, where they will soon be the biggest religious and ethnic group and more able to change the culture and the law. <coughs> the rise of atheism. Proverbs 14, 1 says, Only a fool says in his heart there is no God. But we get it. Dawkins et al. We've got them now with uh, A.C. Grayling. Professor of Philosophy, Committed Atheist, uh, Professor Dawkins and a few others now have got permission and say they've got the funding to establish their own university. What's that about? It's about not philosophy, it's about atheism and opposition to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The rise of atheism brings with it homosexuality and gay rights, constant compromise of ethical and moral rightness in overseas trade, and anti-Christian directives through various governments, including, for us, the EU. The one world religion, which is based on this religious pluralism, that the laws which are passed that you have to recognise as equal any other religion. Everybody can pursue their own religion, their own religious ideas, and all are equal. I cannot accept that because it's not true. I cannot accept the lie, I will not live under that lie, there is but one God, Amen. and he's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. he is Father, Son and Holy Spirit, Amen. he's the only one that saved us, he's the only one with a plan which is so wonderful for the salvation of mankind, the only one who can raise the dead, heal the sick, and who can liberate the captives, and who has a plan for eternity, that his people should be with him, and live in peace and love. There is no other God, so I won't accept that. But that's what religious pluralism is about. It's about accepting that. And in this country, religious pluralism has, our law has pushed, used that in order to promote Islam. Yeah. Not just religiously, but don't forget now, one of the problems which we're facing is there's a consultation out in the Christian Institute to talk about it, is, is now they want to move even more to settling their own disputes, religious and, and civil, through not just Sharia courts, but through their own conciliation and arbitration systems. They already have a shadow government, you know, shadow parliament. They already have Sharia courts. So you already have, a, 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 if you like, a country within a country. And religious pluralism actually enables that and enables the legislation to be drafted in the EU and in this country. 
And there is at the moment nothing you or I can do about that, but simply be prepared to stand and say no. Because un until Jesus comes again, this will not be sorted because of the, of the way things are going. Religious pluralism uh, shows that with the EU, the trial run again, that, that Christianity is more and more sidelined as being irrelevant. That, that there will be created a new religion and everybody will fall into that one religion and that system of thought. So it becomes more like Buddhism, Confucianism. It becomes more up here and not in here. It's about what you think and how you construct proposals uh, and ideas. Just like science, when you come up with, 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 with some sort of postulate a theory. But actually, it has nothing to do with a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's why human rights, that despite what the liberal left will say, the human rights legislation is absolutely wrong. It is not Christian. It might sound it, but it's not. And has actually been intended to be used to silence Christians, and that's what it's being used for. Christian Institute are in the European courts so often trying to deal with this to get people off all the charges that are brought against them because they're Christian. <coughs> because they don't have rights, but the Muslims do. Even the Jews are, are getting hit all the time too, because we're classed together, quite right. And the World Council of Churches, as I've mentioned, their decision shows more and more that they're allied to this left-wing uh, liberal thinking. The agenda which inculcates the BBC, parts of the civil service, uh, and the church. Pluralism. Pluralism takes you down, or if you like, it takes you onto a map where there are so many roads, and you don't know which one to choose. And what it says on it is that any one of them will take you to where you want to be. Yet, they're all going in different directions. My map book says there is but one way, yeah. and he is the way, the truth <laughs> and the life. Amen. Amen. Israel and Judaism, well, we see more and more. The attack on Israel is just quite out in the front now. There's no need to try and hide behind fancy words or anything. The resolutions made, the trade resolutions by the United Nations, uh, and then supported by other groups religiously, like the World Council Churches, uh, uh, evidence of that, the boycotting of Israeli professors by English universities, they don't want they want to actually take it the other way and try to, 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 to bring them into a different position <laughs> but not accepting the Jewish position or Jewish sovereignty and then the UN threats on that very same sovereignty uh, and upon Jerusalem as being the centre of God's plan for the salvation of the world and the place where Jesus will return the one thing the enemy will try and do, and he is trying to do, is take that off the map. He might think if he did, which he won't, then there'd be nowhere for Jesus to come back to. But then he's stupid. And he was defeated at Calvary. And he can huff and puff as much as he wants. But at the end of the day, God's people will be victorious because he is God. Well, I'm sorry that, I mean, I suppose we could have gone to university for a, a whole term and done this stuff, but I just tried to give you some headings, really. But I can assure you, I've got files full of the backup. I tried to distill it for you. The notes have a bit more on, and I pray that's helped you with the jigsaw. Uh, I moved from a few pieces, started a bit, uh, to a few more, looking more like a completed one, in the hope that that has taken us to that place in our understanding of the return of Jesus. <coughs> Hallelujah. Thank you. I'm not going to speak for too long. Um, and then we'll just sing a couple of songs at the end. And then uh, if there are any questions or any discussion, Andrew and I will do, particularly Andrew, will do our best <laughs> to, to answer them. I am aware that there are some people here who don't hold the same view that, you know, the church is going to be raptured. They feel, they believe that the church is going to go through the tribulation. Um, we're not here to try and persuade in any way. We're simply here to preach, teach what we believe. Um, so I, I do make the offer, if anyone wants to come and see me, see Andrew afterwards over here, I'll try and answer any questions and we'll look at scriptures, whatever you would like, if that would be helpful.
All right, so the offer's on the table, as it were. Someone asked me um, if Christians are going to receive the mark. Well, again, it depends what view you hold. You see, the mark... Yeah, I'm, I am switched on. Am I not loud enough? Okay, I'm sure. Oh, hang on. Perhaps it's my fault. I'm on orange oh, instead of green. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's in uh, Revelation 13, after the beast from the earth comes, which is the Antichrist, and the beast out of the sea, which is the fourth prophet. That is at the midpoint of the tribulation, three and a half years. And what that means is that the full character of the Antichrist and false prophet are revealed. Mm. doesn't mean to say they're not around. They are around during the first three and a half years. But the true nature is revealed. <coughs> and the false prophet then tries to get everyone to accept the mark, the 666, which means that they will be totally subservient and worship the Antichrist after he's gone to the temple in Jerusalem. But of course, if we believe that we're going to be raptured, we won't be faced with that prospect, because we won't be here. But those who are saved during the tribulation certainly will. And because the vast majority will refuse, they will probably be martyred because of their stand for their faith. All right? Now, if you believe that the church is going through the tribulation, well, all of us are going to be faced with that decision. Okay? Mm -hmm. Only God knows. Mm -hmm. um, Sue and I have just recently come back from uh, Spain where we were looking after a, an English church in Benidorm and uh, I have to say that the behaviour of the people, particularly the British there, mm -hmm. was far, far worse than we saw last year. Mm -hmm. I mean... The depth of depravity. Mm -hmm. I said to Living Word Church, if Sodom and Gomorrah was worse than that, you know, it must have been terrible. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, it was really bad. Again, another sign of the times, mm -hmm. just of the total degradation and the lowering of moral standards. Mm -hmm. You know, they were behaving like animals. Oh. No other word could mm -hmm. describe it. Someone asked me, because I haven't seen a lot of you since I uh, came back from the Philippines with Richard, just to say we had a really good time, uh, and we did see in two weeks over 300 prisoners get saved. Hallelujah. So give the glory to God yes. for that. And I know Andrew's been to Germany, Czechoslovakia, Slovakia. He goes anywhere where they will have it. <laughs> <laughs> So do pray for us, you know, we, we try to take the, the gospel message of the Lord wherever we can. And, uh, you know, it is frontline stuff, and we do come under attack. Greater is he that's in us than he's in the world, but the reality is that the devil doesn't like it, and he is angry. So please do pray for your pastors, church leaders, and all those who are in frontline positions. Let's turn to Mark 24. No, Matthew 24. <laughs> Matthew 24. And verse 42. <clears throat> really, this is a, a follow-on from what Andrew uh, said so well this morning. And remember, the context is that Jesus is answering the question of the disciples. They ask, what are the signs of the end of the age? <coughs> and Jesus says in verse 42, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. And that is in the present tense. <coughs> now that was a word not only for the disciples, the Gospel of Matthew is written for the Jews, but I believe it's also a word for us. Because written in the present tense, it's saying, keep watching. Keep watching. 
Watch what's happening in the world. We need to be aware of what's going on. You know, I know some Christians who don't read newspapers, don't watch the news, but I think we should. Not to feed our fleshly appetite, but so we can pray. And we can pray specifically about what's going on. And beloved, in these days we've got to be people of prayer. We really have, because the days are urgent. And then in verse 44, Jesus goes on to say, So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. <laughs> and again, the inference there is that things are going to happen very quickly. <clears throat> I believe with all my heart that we are living in the days leading up to the end of the age. And I think we can all identify with the fact that things in the world are moving faster and faster. A tremendous rate. If you think back to the beginning of this year and how sort of world events have, have changed and happened, things are really happening fast. Daniel 12, verse 4 in the King James, it says, and that the context there is talking about the end times, <clears throat> it says, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Yeah. Well, you're, you're seeing in these days men running to and fro. Mm -hmm. It's not only in London, getting off the tube stations and all running to work, but everywhere men are running. <clears throat> you know? And in the last 10 years, <clears throat> knowledge has increased more than in the rest of time put together. That is the progress in, you know, technology and, and many other areas, science, etc., etc. Man thinks, you see, that with his great increase in knowledge, that he can solve all the problems of the world. <clears throat> Doesn't need God. Man can sort it all out. Well, when we see the chaos that's going on around us, and the absolute folly of man, you know, it's stupidity, isn't it? But you see, man is blinded. Man is blinded to the truth and the reality. The world is going, man thinks that the world is going on and on. It's been in existence for millions of years. It's going to carry on for millions of years. That's the lie of evolution. Man thinks he doesn't need God to help him. You know, we found out in Benidorm, we did some evangelism, it wasn't easy. We found mockers and scoffers more than we did a year ago <clears throat> on the high street in Cosham last Saturday. People were mocking and scoffing, laughing at us, having pity on us, poor Christians. How stupid they are. It's a sign of the times. Mm. It really is. As Andrew said this morning, you know, there will be an increase in mocking and scoffing in the end times. And I believe we're certainly seeing that yeah. in these days. Man is foolish. It's like the Tower of Babel. Man thought he could build a tower big enough that he could get out of the reach of God. I mean, how stupid is that? <laughs> See, man... <coughs> Is stupid because he doesn't know the character of God. And God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. There's nowhere where we can go, as the psalmist says, that is out of the reach and sight of God. You see, men don't know the Bible. And they, as a con consequence, don't realise that God has a plan and a timetable. And that timetable is going to be fulfilled right on time. You know, God is outside of time, but God has a very detailed plan. It's so detailed that it includes every aspect of our life within his eternal plan. So nothing happens by accident, but only according to God's time and permission. Things happen, God allows things to happen, by his permissive, wi permissive will. Mm. All right? God is in control. <coughs> and when we know that and believe it, we need to remind ourselves constantly, God is in control. 
It brings everything else into perspective. Hallelujah. And we as the people of God do not need to be fearful. Jesus said no one can snatch us out of his hands. Hallelujah. So our God is omnipotent. He's omnipresent. And he is omniscient. And he is sovereign. God has the last word in everything. <clears throat> if you want to say amen, please feel free. Amen. Thank you. There was a day when God started his creation. We read about it in Genesis 1, Genesis 2. There was a day when God the Father sent his Son to die on the cross for the sins of the world. And there will be a day when Jesus is coming back. When the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all unbelievers will be destroyed at the battle of Armageddon. And there will be a day when Jesus begins his thousand year reign on this earth. Revelation 20. And there will be a day, as we saw, at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ, when all unbelievers will be judged at the great white throne judgment, when the books will be opened, and then eternity will begin. And man will go to his eternal destination. There's two places, aren't there? Unbelievers will go to the eternal lake of fire. We, the people of God, who have received Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, will go to be with the Lord in eternity, in the delights and wonders of the new Jerusalem. If ever you, I will say this to Christians, if ever you're feeling a bit dead or depressed, read Revelation 21, 22, mm. the wonderful description of the new Jerusalem, the streets of gold and the wonderful jewels and everything else. And, you know, God has only revealed a tiny little bit of the picture. It's going to be so wonderful. If we knew the full wonder of what is coming, it would blow our minds. Mm. It really would. Yeah. Noah was vigilant and obedient in preparing for the flood and I think, beloved, as Christians, as the people of God we have to be vigilant, we have to be alert through the Holy Spirit as we prepare for the coming of the Lord this is certainly no time to be sitting back and saying well the Lord has done it all, I don't need to be doing anything the Lord has decided in his wisdom that he is going to use his church to bring about his purposes. Hallelujah. And so we've got to be full of God's spirit. You know, one of the biggest tragedies in the church in these days is that there is such a spirit, what I call a spirit of apathy and complacency. We've got to be up and at it. Hallelujah. Remember one day we are going to stand before the Lord and give an account for how we've used our time and the gifts that the Lord has graciously given us. Let's just go to Ephesians chapter 6. And I know you know this. Certainly most of you do. The armour of God. But I just wanted to remind us because I think in these days when the enemy is uh, around like a roaring lion that we need the full protection of God. Ephesians 6, verse 10. <coughs> Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take a stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled round your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. 
and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Mm. And I pray that for all of us, beloved, that we may go forth and proclaim the gospel message of Jesus fearlessly in these days. Amen. So Lord, give us more courage. Yes. Give us more boldness, we pray. Lord, you've given us a commission. Lord, we want to fulfil your commission. Lord, the world needs to hear about Jesus. Amen. And Lord, use us as your vessels, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, Paul talks there about the need for believers. Notice several times he says, put on the full armour. No good putting on pieces of it, because you can bet your life that one of the devil's arrows will come to the place where you haven't put your armour yes. on. Yeah. He's not daft. Okay. So we put on the full armour of God to protect us against the attacks and the lies of the devil. The devil is the enemy of God, and so he is our enemy. Jesus said, John 10 verse 10, that the thief, the enemy, the devil, comes only to steal, <coughs> kill, and destroy. Now, he is a powerful enemy, but let's not forget, he is a defeated enemy. Amen. Amen. All right? Paul says, put on the full armour of God, that we may stand our ground. That is, that we won't give any way to the devil. We don't give him any ground. The breastplate of righteousness is so important because it's there to protect our heart. We've always got to do what is right with the help of God so that the devil won't have anything to accuse us of. Remember, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. And he loves to go and say to God, look at so-and-so, look at what they're doing, look at this one, what they're doing. But if we're walking upright before God, he's got nothing to accuse us of. Amen? Amen. Amen. Put on the belt of truth, that is, know the word of God. Know it, meditate on it, and hold on to it. <coughs> Jesus spoke the word of God, and we've got to do that also. You know, one of the things I do is often I speak out the word of God. I often pray the Psalms, and it's powerful mm. to pray out loud the word of God, because it is living and active. <clears throat> you know, the Lord just showed me something this last week in prayer, and I've had very much on my heart the longing for revival to come. Mm. What the Lord just showed me was that revival, with revival, there must be a return to the Word of God. Mm. You can't have revival and enjoy all the happy, clappy, you know, the froth and the bubble. We've got to have the foundation of the Word of God to stand on it. That's why so many revivals haven't lasted very long. Because there hasn't been the, the study and the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God to go along with them. We've got to put on the helmet of salvation to protect our mind. Because that's where the devil attacks us, in our mind. God speaks to our heart, the devil speaks to our mind. We're going to have our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. You know, a Roman soldier's feet were <clears throat> shod with hard, studded shoes. And Paul uses this image to represent the preparation of the gospel of peace. It meant either that the gospel is the firm foundation on which Christians are to stand. And beloved, the gospel message is powerful. I don't know if it's been your experience, but it's certainly been mine, that in a church service, when the gospel message is preached, there always seems to be more power at the front mm. than maybe at the rear of the church, mm. at the actual very point of where the gospel message is preached. Extra power seems to come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm. 
It also could mean that the Christian should always be ready to defend and to spread the gospel. So we should be doing our best to live peaceably with all men, because only in that way can we fully represent Jesus. There is a place for righteous anger. We all know what Jesus did in the temple with the money changers. But we've always got to check our heart and our motives. And we're to take hold of the shield of faith. You know, a Roman soldier's shield, it measured approximately two and a half feet by four feet. It was a big shield. And our shield offers protection against all the fiery darts of the enemy. You see, the flaming arrows couldn't penetrate the fireproof shield of the ancient Roman soldier. And nor can the attacks of Satan penetrate into the believer who has his his or her faith firmly in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we have to be in fellowship with God to enjoy his full protection. If we go away from God, if we get what we say out of fellowship, or we allow unconfessed sin to be present in our lives, it gives Satan legal right of entry. There is a gap in the hedge of protection around us, and you can be sure that the devil will come straight in to where that gap is. In Job 1 verse 10, even Satan acknowledged that God had put a hedge of protection around Job and his household. Satan says, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything that he has? The other part of the armour is the sword of the spirit, which again we have to take up. It involves determined action. And the sword of the Spirit is the only offensive weapon in the believer's armour. The sword of the Spirit is not necessarily the Bible as a whole, but we know from Hebrews 4 verse 12 that the Word of God is living and active. But you see, when we read and speak out the Word of God, God imparts something of His being into our being. That's his life and his power. And so the sword of the Spirit is more the specific word of God that needs to be spoken in a specific situation. But you see, to have the precise word ready, we have to know the Bible. If Paul was a great Christian, he was a great man of prayer. And without prayer, all the armour in the world would be of no use. Paul says in Ephesians 6, put on the pieces of the armour and then pray. And it's prayer that keeps the armour in position. And Paul encourages us to pray for one another and to pray for all believers, particularly those who are on mission and serving in dangerous places. That is part of our responsibility as part of the body of Christ. Now Paul was not ashamed to ask other believers to pray that he would have the courage and the boldness to proclaim the gospel fearlessly. But even as a prisoner, Paul wanted to be a faithful witness to the Lord. And beloved, I ask you to ask your heart, search your heart, Do you want to be a faithful witness to the Lord in these end times? See, we've got to be more willing to ask other believers to pray for us in the same way that Paul unashamedly did. You know, so often I think we're guilty of thinking, well, you know, I don't want to trouble anyone else. They've got enough problems of their own. I can sort it out. I'm okay. But beloved, God has put us in a body Because we need one another. And we need to pray for one another and watch out for one another, as good soldiers do. 
And above all, beloved, when Christians come together and pray, there is power. There is power in unity, and we need powerful prayers to be going up in these days. We've got to lay aside our pride. We've got to acknowledge that we do need one another, and we need one another's prayers. See, without Jesus in our life, we cannot be effective. Jesus said in John 15, 5, Apart from me, you can do nothing. So we might have lots of good ideas, but unless we have the Holy Spirit working in us and through us, it's not going to achieve anything. We achieve good fruit when it's the work of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. So, beloved, what I'm saying, and I really say it with all my heart, we as the people of God have got to be watchful and alert. Mm. I don't think we can afford to switch off in these days. Mm. You know, watching as far as we are able to do so, what is happening in the world, comparing it with the many prophecies in the Bible about the end times, and what Jesus said would be the signs of the end of the age in Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13. And I will say again, I think it's so important that we understand the book of Revelation. So many Christians dismiss it, preachers dismiss it because it's too complicated. But actually, it's quite simple. And I'll say again, it is in chronological order. Get a good commentary or good commentaries and read it and ask God to give you understanding and revelation as you read the book of Revelation, because it's probably the most relevant book to the days in which we're living, Mm. because these are the things that have been coming soon. As I say, there's a couple of sets of my teaching on the book book of Revelation. It's a verse-by-verse study of the book of Revelation. But you see, to be alert in these days... There is no other way but to be full of the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Ephesians 5 verse 18, Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, it's in the present tense. Be filled and keep on being filled with the Spirit. Because it's the Holy Spirit that gives us spiritual life, gives us wisdom, understanding and strength and power, both spiritually and also physically. When we're full of the Holy Spirit, it's not just our spirit life that comes alive, but also it brings our physical body alive. And I don't know about you, but I need as much help as I can get in my physical body in these days. We need the gifts of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12. We need particularly the gifts of wisdom and spiritual discernment. The Bible says in the end times there will be false teachers false prophets. There'll be many out there deceiving. But we need to be able to discern between truth and error and between good and evil. And one of the things we must be doing as the people of God in these days is listening to God. We need his guidance. We need his wisdom because he knows all things and he sees all things. He is our protector, he is our provider, he is the source of all good things. Amen? Amen. Psalm 37 verse 28 says, For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. They will be protected forever. That should give us comfort this afternoon. That should give us hope. Hallelujah. The Lord loves us and he's promised to provide us. He's with us every step of the way. And being full of the Holy Spirit helps us because it helps us to be more tuned in to the voice of God. We are more attentive when we are full of the Holy Spirit. And we must listen to God because it's vital to our relationship with Him. God is a relational being. He loves relationship with His people. We read in the Garden of Eden, Jesus walked and had fellowship and communion 
with Adam and Eve. And that is the heart of God. And that's why he delights in us spending time with him. And it does us good. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. You see, God pays attention to us because he loves us. He loves us. And listening doesn't happen by accident. It has to be intentional. It has to be planned. It has to be a conscious act of the will. We have to decide, I am going to spend time alone with God. Whether it's 10, 20, 30, an hour, whatever it is. I do not think in these days we can afford to miss our time with God. In fellowship with Him, to receive from Him, to get His strengthening power, but also simply to tell Him how much we love Him and we appreciate Him. <coughs> you know, I always quote the example of little Samuel as a boy. But he said to the Lord, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. We often say, don't we, Lord God, listen to me. Your servant is speaking. <laughs> we want to speak to God more than we want to listen to Him. We've got to set time aside, find a play, quiet place, and wait on God. Matthew 6, verse 6, Jesus said, Go into your room, shut the door, and pray. You can't have it more simple than that, can you? And we, when we go to the Lord, you know, so often I think we're tempted to go with our shopping list. Lord, I need this, and I need that, and will you do this, and will you do that? But sometimes we've just got to spend time letting God speak to us. And God will put on our hearts what's on his heart. And then we know that we're praying according to his will. And that's powerful. Powerful when we pray according to the heart and will of God. And always remember that prayer is a two-way conversation. You know, in normal conversation, you have to allow time for listening. I know some people find that hard. But I'm not looking at anyone. But... <laughs> And we ask yourself, you know, do you spend more time talking than listening? When you're talking to people, normal conversation. Do you like to hold the conversation? Is it more you than them? We've got to be good listeners. One of the hallmarks of good relationship is to be a good listener. We've got to respect the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. He is a real person. But we've got to have reverence and awe. One of the tragedies, another tragedy in the church in these days, I think it's lost a lot of its awe and respect for the Holy Spirit. Just sees him as a plaything. You know, something to get excited about. Yeah, we do get excited about God. But let's remember, he's a holy God. And we need to have reverence and awe. But always remembering that Jesus is our friend and our brother and the Holy Spirit is our helper the paraclete, the one who comes alongside us to guide us to comfort us, to strengthen us and to show us the way you now the disciples asked questions of Jesus because they didn't feel intimidated by him Jesus was always approachable and that's the way we've got to be as the people of God. You know, sometimes in our busy lives, it can be a real pain when people want to come and take your time. You find it particularly when you're a church pastor. You know, you're constantly getting people coming and they want to offload their burdens and do this and that. And... But the heart of Jesus is to welcome people and to have time for them. And so the Holy Spirit is approachable. He has time for us. And he's never irritated by the questions that we ask. He understands that our flesh is weak. So what I'm saying, beloved, is don't hesitate to go to the Lord. Something you don't understand, you're you know, concerned about, ask the Lord. Ask him to show you. Ask him to bring you understanding. And one last thing on listening to God. You know, listening to God is actually a learning process. And it's not reasonable to assume that any and every thought that comes into our mind 
is automatically God speaking to us. You know, there are other voices out there. Sometimes it's our own flesh. Sometimes it is the spirit of the world. Sometimes it is the devil. That's why we need the gift of spiritual discernment to discern whether it's of God or not of God. John 10 verse 4, Jesus said, My sheep will know my voice. And the more you spend time listening to God, the easier it becomes to recognise his voice. It's like anything, when you practice it, you become better at it. And this is a practical thing that I really put before you. Spend time in the presence of God and spend time listening to him. And the more you do it, the easier it will become to discern what is of God and what is not of God. You see, because time is short, we cannot afford to be wasting time. And so we need to know what is of God so we can do it. Because then we will bring good fruit and we will be effective. <clears throat> Most of the direction that we need for our lives is in this wonderful Bible. But we also need the balance of the Holy Spirit who also speaks God, God's word to us. Revelation 1 verse 15 says, His voice is like the sound of many waters. And I want to tell you this, beloved, the voice of Jesus will be heard over every other voice yes. Yes. if we have a heart to hear. Praise you. If we have a heart to hear the voice of the Lord, the Lord will make sure that we hear. We need to be expectant to know that God wants to speak to us and he wants to guide us. He wants us to be doing his will. He wants us to be doing his will. So we need to hear God's voice as part of everyday life. And the days in which we're living, they're exciting in many ways, but they're also dangerous days. I believe the devil does know that his time is short, and he is out there, and he is dangerous, and that's why we need to be full of the Holy Spirit, in fellowship with God, and pressing on with him. <clears throat> We always remember that God will choose how he will speak to us and when he will speak to us. In these days, I find that God speaks mainly through his word. If we neglect his word, we could risk not hearing from God. So that's why we should be spending time reading the word of God. In ancient days, God spoke mainly through the prophets. We're living in these days when there is a real shortage of prophetic voices, particularly in this land. I think one of our urgent prayers is we need the gift of prophecy to come back to the church. We really do. Sometimes God speaks to us through that small inner voice, that inner feeling. And again, we need to discern what is of God and what is not of God. Sometimes God speaks through dreams and visions, <coughs> The dreams, by the way, come when you're asleep. The visions normally come when you're awake, if that's helpful. <laughs> Sometimes God does speak by his audible voice. I find that it's very rare in these days, but we still should expect to hear the actual voice of God speaking to us. Sometimes God uses other men and women to bring his counsel to us. But always, when someone comes and says, I have the word of the Lord for you, Always check it out with two or three witnesses. Three things must line up. It must always accord with the word of God. God will never speak anything that contravenes his word. You should always get the witness of the Holy Spirit and also the circumstances should line up. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16 says, We have the mind of of Christ. And that mind of Christ is revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the spiritual man and the spiritual woman has the potential to understand all things. And so as the people of God, we can be taught and instructed by God because we have the mind of Christ. Now, 
We all need to be in the centre of God's will for our lives. The centre of God's will is the highest place that we can attain to. God wants us to be there because he wants us to be doing the things that he wants us to do. If you don't know God's will for your life, I have a simple piece of advice for you. Ask him. Mm. Ask him to show you. And be patient and wait on him. He will show you because that's where he wants you to be and that's what he wants you to be doing. And that's where we can be the most effective in God's kingdom. If anyone wants prayer for this, come and see me at the end and I'll pray for you. Discerning the will of God for your <coughs> life. Always we've got to remember that God has given us free will. He allows us to choose our own way. But I believe that God has a best way for us. And that way is called the highway. We can either go the highway or we can go the low way. But the highway is the place of reward and is the most effective way. Isaiah 35 verse 8, and I'm going to come to a conclusion now, but Isaiah 35 verse 8 says, And a highway will be there. It will be the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way. And I believe one of the main requirements for the church in these last days is that the people of God must be living holy lives. 1 Peter 1 verse 15, God says, Be holy because I am holy. Be holy because I am holy. You know, in his life, Jesus lived a completely righteous life. He fulfilled the law in every way. And when he ascended, because of his righteousness and his holiness, he could go straight to heaven and he could look upon the face of God his Father. He then distributed his robes of righteousness, thousands of them, which enable believers like you and me to approach God. Not in our own righteousness, but the righteousness of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, He became sin who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. And so through the holiness of Jesus, we have received a robe of righteousness, which means that we can go directly to God. We can look at him full in the face, and we can approach the throne of grace with boldness and confidence, <coughs> enabling us to receive from him his holiness. And this is part and purpose of the work of Jesus. John 17, verse 19, Jesus said, For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. As you know, sanctified means to make holy. And so we have been sanctified. It has been done. But we have to live the life of holiness and sanctification. We can do it with the help of the Holy Spirit. Not in our strength, but through Him. Jesus, I believe, is referring to self-sacrifice and total commitment. And the purpose is that we might start and come into the holiness of God. Mm. You see, the moment we were saved, God declared us to be holy and righteous because of the work of Jesus. But the purpose is that we might come more and more into that righteousness and holiness in our lives on this earth. Whatever God desires us to do, he speaks about it in faith first, and then we have to come into it. He declares us holy, and we have to come into the holiness. He declares us holy first through the work of Jesus. <clears throat> we are being predestined, or we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Do you remember when the Israelites first went into the promised land and they looked at Jericho and God said to them, Jericho will be mine. In other words, God was saying, Jericho belongs to me. Now the Israelites didn't say, great, Jericho belongs to God, 
we don't have to do anything. God declared that Jericho was his, and then the people had to go and make it his, as it were. They had to march round it for seven days. So again, God has made us holy through the work of Jesus, that we might come into his holiness. And I'll finish with this. I believe there are five things that characterise a holy man or woman and characterise those who are on the path to holiness. <clears throat> First of all, a person who is heading for holiness basically agrees with God and is of one mind with God. The more you agree with God and the more you are one mind with God, the holier you are. It means that you agree with his judgments. It means that you hate the things that God hates and you love the things that God loves. In getting our lives dealt with, we've got to agree with God in the matter. It involves acknowledging that God is always right. You see, the moment we start to try and justify ourselves and our behaviour, we will not get free of the problems, whatever they may be. Whether it's lying, swearing, lust, thieving, jealousy, whatever it is. We mustn't think, well, so what? God still loves me. He'll forgive me, regardless. You see, sin has consequences. And these things are an affront to a holy God. And so we've got to agree with him that these things are wrong. Secondly, the second characteristic of a holy person is that he regularly confesses his sin before God, using 1 John 1 9, and receives the forgiveness and cleansing that God gives. There should be a desire in our hearts for God to deal with the sin which is in our hearts so that we want to avoid it. Thirdly, a person who wants to be holy wants their heart to be right so that we no longer want to think or do that which is sinful. We've got to want holiness on the inside. And if we can honestly say that is what we really, really want, then I believe that we're on the path to holiness. And fourthly, the holy person is the person who definitely tries their hardest, with the help of the Holy Spirit, to be like Jesus. You see, we have to use our will that Jesus might be seen in us. So ask the Holy Spirit to help us. And fifthly, the holy person, or the person going along the path to holiness, desires with all their heart to be holy, to be the very best for God. We should be desire to be holy, first of all, because God commands it. We should desire it because we can't bear the thought that a holy God views our sin. And we desire it because it shows that we are saved and belong to God, and it is proof that we love God. You see, God doesn't want us in holiness because he knows that those who are living holy lives will see the Lord. <coughs> so we as Christians should be some of the most outstanding people on the face of the earth you know the world is looking at us it's waiting to see how we react and behave and what our attitude is so beloved we should be outstanding in every way more loving than anyone else more forgiving than anyone else we should have higher standards than anyone else. And even though we've got different personalities and we come from different backgrounds, we have different ways of appearing and speaking, yet we should have such high standards that say to the world, if God can do it in me, then he can do it for absolutely <coughs> anyone. And all that we should do, beloved, should glorify the Lord. Because we are his people. We've been bought with a price, the sacrificial blood of Jesus, and we are here to serve him. We've got to be different. And that is what God has called us to be. And it's got to be a revelation of holiness. 
And it's my prayer and hope this afternoon that you'll be encouraged to walk the way of holiness. It does take courage. It takes determination. It takes self-sacrifice to walk on the highway of holiness. But I know this, that if we will do it, God will not only help us, but he will bless us. If we apply our will to do the will of God, God, I believe, will bless us enormously. And we don't do it because we want to be blessed. We do it because we love the Lord. Mm -hmm. You see, if we apply our will to do his will, we receive the gift of holiness from heaven. And the highway of holiness leads us to heaven on earth. Mm -hmm. And so, beloved, in these last days, I think we've got to take every opportunity to share the good news of Jesus. Because he is the hope of the world. There is no other hope. He is the only way to heaven. Salvation is found in no one else. Mm, only our precious Saviour. Mm -hmm. So Father, we just come to you and we thank you that our God is a holy God. Yes. You are righteous in all your ways. You are, and we thank you, Jesus, that through your perfect obedience and sacrifice, you have given us a robe of righteousness. Mm. Thank you, Father, we can come directly to you. Thank you, Lord, that nothing is there to stop us. The barrier has been broken, mm. and we can come into your presence. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I humbly ask this afternoon that you will, Lord, search our hearts by the Holy Spirit mm. and help us to walk on that highway of holiness, that we might glorify you in everything we do, in everything we say, that as the world looks at us, they will see Jesus in us. Lord, build us up, I pray, in our holy faith. And make us the people that you've designed us to be. Because, Lord, we want to serve you. And, Lord, we just want to say we love you. We appreciate you, Jesus. We love you so much. Amen. Amen. Amen.